we've now gone through a sketch of the the boost algorithm and uh, just a couple of quick reminders uh, the the key idea behind boosting is that we uh, are not learning a whole bunch of models in parallel but instead learning them in sequence we we lose parallelization when we do this but the advantage is that the new models that we learn can actually turn around and correct errors that are uh, the previous models uh, are generating. I know the derivation that we went through was a little bit long. I apologize for that. Um, but it turns out that scikit-learn actually has a, a very nice, clean implementation that we can uh, access. So let's look at some code. All right, we're still in the context of the uh, Jupyter Notebook, uh, where we've been working uh, with our ensembles. Uh, so all of our data are still uh, loaded. Uh, so this boosting section is also in the skeleton that, that I gave you. Um, the uh, Ada Boost classifier class uh, takes as input a uh, some sort of uh, classifier. Uh, we can choose whichever one we want. In our case, I, I'm going to grab a decision tree classifier. So let's do that. And I'm going to make it a pretty impoverished uh, decision tree. I'm going to only going to give it 10 leaf nodes. And at this stage, you have a pretty good sense of what we can do with a single decision tree and only 10 leaf nodes with this uh, baby data set. So the AdaBoost classifier class takes that classifier that base level classifier as input. We get to specify how many estimators. And I'm going to choose 10 just to, as a starting point. And I'm going to uh, set uh, a parameter. This is a hyperparameter called a learning rate. And uh, this controls how much uh, individual models can contribute to the class labels. So with a learning rate that's closer to one, a single model can uh, completely determine what the, uh, what the labels are for uh, a, single, uh, a single sample. Uh, with a smaller learning rate, and I'm going to choose 0.25 uh, for this case, and this is something I've already played with some. Uh, what this learning rate uh, does is it forces us to have uh, a set of uh, of uh, individual models to uh, to cover our training set samples. So hopefully out of this we get a little bit uh, better generalization. There's definitely, if you look at the documentation for the AdaBoost classifier, there's definitely a trade-off between n estimators and the learning rate. For smaller learning rates, you're going to want more uh, estimators. Okay, so there we go. And this learning rate. And, and now we're going to do uh, cross-validation with uh, tenfolds. Um, so uh, one thing to point out here is that we have one learning model here. We have uh, 10, up to 10 uh, estimators and uh, 10 learning models for this AdaBoost classifier. And then we're executing all of that uh, 10 different times. So, so a class within a class within a class, which is kind of cool. So this shouldn't take uh, too long to uh, execute. So that took about uh, 10 seconds uh, running in parallel on my laptop. Uh, and uh, so here we go. So uh, we have a log loss of 0.9, which is higher than we've seen for some of our uh, classifiers. And we have an AUC of almost 0.7. There's our TPR, FPR curve there. Um, this AUC is uh, not quite up to what we've seen so far, but it's pretty darn close. And what's really fun is that uh, this is really the first thing that we've tried. There's our ROC curve, uh, and we won't look at time series right now. But uh, this is with just a, a, a small uh, model. Uh, and now it's time to try uh, adding, uh, in increasing the uh, size of our model here. Uh, let's go ahead and increase this up to 20. 
and we'll uh, execute that, and which means that's going to take about twice as long as the last execution. Okay, that was about 15 seconds, and notice that our area under the curve now is at 0.72. This is uh, essentially as good as we've uh, seen so far. There's our ROC curve, and that's starting to become uh, a nice healthy distance away from that uh, y equals x line. Let's uh, go ahead and increase the number of estimators again. All right, that was about 45 seconds or so. And our area under the curve now is uh, almost to 0.77, which is really quite uh, astounding. There's our ROC curve there. Uh, so, that's, so that's really exciting. This is better than we've uh, seen in any of the other models that we've been trying, quite a bit better. Since uh, things are continuing to get better, I'd like to uh, increase the uh, number of estimators again. So we're going to double that up to uh, 100. So expect that to take about a minute and a half or so. OK, so that was about a minute of compute time with a, an eight core uh, laptop. Uh, our area under the curve is now at 0.77, which is fantastic. So, so things are continuing to improve. Uh, so I'm tempted to go ahead and uh, increase the number of estimators again. I'm, st again, sticking with factors of two here since I feel like we're already sort of in that uh, sweet spot here or near the sweet spot. So let me go ahead and start that execution. So expect that's probably now more a minute and a half to two minutes of execution time. All right, that was about a minute and a half or so. And uh, we're, uh, our AUC is at 0.768. It's actually a little bit smaller than, uh, than what we saw with 100 uh, estimators. There's a lot of stochasticity in here, so you'd expect a certain degree of variance here. But what it's feeling like is that we're now uh, sort of reaching the plateau of what our performance, uh, uh, what we can get performance-wise out of this particular classifier. So there's our... TPR, FPR curve, this is a really nice pair of curves. And there's our, our uh, ROC curve. And let's go ahead and look at the time series. And uh, one thing to focus on here is that every time we're high here, red definitely is uh, spiking and staying up. And then once, once we transition back to low, most of the time we're staying green uh, until uh, we hit the next one of these. There's a little bit of, there are a few places where red overtakes green again uh, during this range here, um, but uh, red really overtakes uh, green once once we're uh, at this point here. So so red is doing a reasonable job of, of uh, predicting uh, these uh, events. Of course, this time period, which should be labeled as green, is, uh, is red is still uh, very much happy with that. The other place where it's not predicting very well is this region here. And that, and if you recall from the other examples that we've done, uh, we've tended not to do very well uh, in this region. But that's, uh, that's OK. Uh, this is not a perfect predictor. And we certainly have not set this problem up in an optimal way. So I encourage you to play with this uh, a bit more. Try out uh, different complexities of, of classifiers. Try five leaf nodes, try, uh, try 25 leaf nodes, and play with that number of estimators. I, again, for all of these, I would tend to start small so that you're not overfitting the data and then slowly uh, increase things. You can also play with this learning rate here. Look at that trade-off between the number of estimators and, and the learning rate. All right, that, so that's our quick example for uh, classifiers with boosting. Uh, and now it's time to uh, start talking about uh, boosting with regression.